We are going through 2 Samuel. If you have your Bibles, 2 Samuel 12, 21 to 23. And uh, we've been going through the story of David and Bathsheba. And uh, right now we are in a few verses. So it's not really a story that we're looking at. We're just looking at a specific part of 2 Samuel. And I will say that today's message is on a very sensitive topic, right? For a lot of people, this is a topic that really hits hard because it really hits home. And if you'd have, if you'd have asked me even six months ago about the, the thing that I'd want to avoid preaching on the most, this is the topic that, would have, that I would have answered with. However, in that time, I've actually been very encouraged by some of the things that I've found in Scripture. So we know from the Bible that in order to go to heaven, you have to believe in Jesus and what he did for you in dying on the cross for your sins and in rising from the dead. You know, it's not about works. It's, it's about faith. But then we ask the question, what about those whose minds are limited from being able to do that, such as those who are mentally disabled or, of course, in light of this passage today, infants and babies. Like, what happens to them if they pass away before they can understand what they need to in order to believe? And what troubled me about this passage, is, or about that whole topic, is that we don't get that clear of an answer in Scripture, right? There's no verse that says babies automatically go to heaven if they die in infancy. The closest thing that we see to that in the Bible is this passage here. But it's not quite enough to give you a 100% yes. But again, over the past few months, looking into this topic, looking through Scripture, the results that I've found have actually very much encouraged me about this issue. So let's first read 2 Samuel 12, 21 to 23, which comes from David's response after his baby son dies. He refused to eat while he pleaded with the Lord to let him live, but then after his son died, he again ate. So let's read this passage, then I'll pray, and then we'll get into this topic. Then his servants said to him, What is this thing that you have done? You have fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. So Lord, as we look at this little part of, of this big story that we've been going through for a couple weeks. Be with me as I speak. Calm my nerves. And I pray also that if I say anything untrue or wrong, that that would not be believed in the name of Jesus. I want your truths to be what's believed in the name of Jesus. So be with me. Be with us during this uh, sensitive topic and uh, just give us understanding of your word in the name of Jesus and be at work on our hearts in the name of Jesus. Again, you are a good God, and I thank you so much for that. And I just pray that even here in this message, you would be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So there are a lot of different views on this topic that tends to happen when we're not given a completely clear answer in the Bible. But the Bible is what we as Christians, as, as Christ followers, need to look to for truth, right? What's in here is the word of God, and his word is truth. You might be reminded of how Jesus prays to the Father in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. The word of God is truth. And so even though we don't have that clear 100% answer of do infants go to heaven after they die, even though we don't have that in the Bible, we're going to look today at other parts of the Word of God, other parts of the truth that seem to indicate that the answer to that question would be a yes. Now, 
I've always thought that there was some kind of age of accountability, maybe not a specific age, like some people say it's maybe eight, some people might say 12, some even go up to 20. But if there is an age, it probably isn't, oh, on this birthday you become accountable for your sins, your, your sinfulness. Instead, it's probably just at a certain point of understanding. And of course, understanding comes to different people at different ages. And maybe that type of understanding never comes as it may be with some who are mentally disabled. Uh, so maybe it does come, but at a later age, and maybe it does come and it's very early. Maybe it's even at age four or five. We don't know. But for different people, it'd be a different timing. But I've always thought that there was an age of accountability because of something that Paul says in the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And to me, this just clarified that the Bible, of course, sees children differently differently than adults in a moral sense. So yes, it's showing here that reasoning like a child is not a good way to reason, and you should grow up from that. But there's also this sense that the child isn't really expected to reason well, right? I reason like a child. There is an expectation that Paul thinks readers have that a child is not a good reasoner or as good of a thinker or a speaker as someone who has matured. But then, of course, um, if you go off of just this verse and say, you try to say, yeah, there's an age of accountability, then it's not the strongest argument here, right? It's not quite enough to build your theology on. And so for me, while I did think that babies went to heaven when they died, and while I did think there was some sort of age of accountability, which wasn't based on when you turn a certain age, but rather when you begin to understand what you need to in order to re receive Christ, accept Christ, there was still a lot of uncertainty. There was still a lot of uncertainty. Going along with this passage, though, I found some other verses that actually solidify this point even better. And one of them is from another very famous passage, uh, Isaiah's prophecy about Emmanuel, a passage that you might hear a lot about at Christmas time. It's Isaiah 7, 14 to 16, which says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse evil and choose good. Refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. So notice that, right? Before the boy knows how to refuse evil and choose good. Refuse the evil and choose the good. Of course, there's a time when children aren't so knowledgeable about what's good and what's bad. And again, that takes us back to the reasoning of a child being different than the reasoning of someone older. But let's look also at what it says in the Old Testament law, right? In the book of Deuteronomy. So just a bit of context. God had freed Israel from being enslaved in Egypt. He brought them out after 10 miraculous plagues against the Egyptians. And then he parted the Red Sea in order for Israel to escape. And he brought them to the promised land. But after he had done all that for them, they saw the giants of the land and they feared they wouldn't be able to defeat them. Even after God had, had showed He'd shown he can do anything and that he could easily bring them victory in miraculous ways. They still feared that they wouldn't be able to defeat the giants, so all but two turned their backs on God. They grumbled, they complained, they basically called God a liar and one who breaks his promises because they said he brought us all this way just to kill us. They say things like it would have been better to stay in slavery in Egypt. And so God is just so 
upset about this because he's done so much for them already. And so because of that, there is punishment. So let's read about that. Deuteronomy 1, 34 to 39. This is Moses talking. Moses says this, And the Lord heard your words and was angered, and he swore not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and his children I will give the land on which he has trodden, because he has wholly followed the Lord. Even with me, so that's Moses, even with me the Lord was angry on your account and said, you shall not go in there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. And as for your little ones, who you said you would become a prey, and your children, who today have no knowledge of good or evil, they shall go in there. So they were saying that their little ones, their their children would become a prey, but their little ones, their children, will be able to enter the promised land unlike the older generation. But again, it says about the children, it says these children have no knowledge of good or evil, and they don't seem here to be held accountable in the same way as those who do have that knowledge, right, as the older generation. So, does that mean infants and children are not sinful? No. We're all born sinful. We're all sinful from conception, and you spend time with some of the younger kids or or toddlers, and, and you notice, yes, they do have a sin nature for sure. But it does seem like God looks at the sin of children and infants, those who have no real knowledge of good and evil. It seems like he looks at their sin a bit differently. For instance, let's go through a passage where God really talks about sin. Uh, It's in Romans 1, and Paul is describing a lot of evil here. So it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Well, it's not plain to infants, right? Them wouldn't include infants. Because God has shown it to them, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. So this is actually a really big thing. Because we have creation all around us, it's supposed to point us to a creator, right? It's supposed to point us to God. It's how God has made his, himself evident to us. So if we deny him after seeing all this creation, we really are without excuse when it comes to judgment day. But for a baby who is just new to this world, again, their knowledge and understanding, it doesn't grasp, it doesn't grasp those same things. So while those a bit older are without excuse, Infants might very well have an excuse, right? Paul continues on, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, right? This doesn't seem to be talking about babies. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so this is, yeah, again, just describing people in general. We can tell it's not talking about babies. Claiming to be wise, right? Babies don't claim to be wise like this. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So, 
yeah, this passage is, of course, talking about those with understanding, right? Those who are not babies. So even though children are sinful, and they're born that way, and they've been that way since conception, it doesn't seem like they're judged in quite the same way because of their lack of understanding and knowledge on good and evil. Also, I know that God takes no pleasure in anyone's death, But when he talks about those who harm or hinder children, it seems to anger him a lot more. He has such strong, strong words for them. So in Matthew 18, verses 1 to 6, Jesus' disciples come to him with a question. And it says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So, of course, the knowledge and understanding of the child are not what Jesus' Jesus' example is about. His example is about the humility of the child. That's what he wants to get across. Jesus is teaching that the humble are the greatest in the kingdom. But then he says this, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Those are strong, strong, strong words against anyone who would lead a child astray. Jesus has strong feelings when it comes to protecting kids' eternities. Now, there are those who believe that the babies of believers will be saved, but the babies of unbelievers will not be saved, so the salvation of the baby has to do with the parent. But I want to kind of uh, dispel that. So a place where that view seems to come from is, again, in the book of 1 Corinthians, and this time it's in chapter 7, verses 13 to 16, and that says, If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is... They are holy. Now, them being holy can create some confusion, right? Because holy, doesn't, doesn't that mean they're saved? And unclean, doesn't that mean they're, they're unsaved? Well, maybe sometimes, but right here, that's not exactly what Paul is talking about. Because even an unbelieving husband, then, in that case, would be saved. But in order to be saved, right, you need to be a believer, not an unbeliever. Furthermore, Paul uses the word saved right afterward, showing that he didn't mean saved in this first part. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister in Christ, so believer in Christ, is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband. Or if the husband is the believer, how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So that shows us that the husband, even being made holy by his wife, if he is an unbeliever, he's still not saved. Right? Because of that question. Paul's asking this question. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? And so if that's the case then using the same word holy for the children would mean you can't say the child being unclean means that he's unsaved, or the child being holy means that he is saved. So this passage does not support that only the children or the infants of believers are saved and the infants of unbelievers are not. It does not support that. Children are not held accountable for their, for their parents' sins, right? They're not held accountable for the sins of their parents. So if the parents are unbelievers, that doesn't mean their infants will be unsaved, right? In Ezekiel 18, verse 4, God says this, 
Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. And a little while later, in verse 20, he revisits this phrase. The soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the Father, nor the Father suffer for the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So the son is not held accountable for the sins of his father. And so the child of unbelievers who still lack that understanding and knowledge of good and evil, if they're not held accountable for their sins because of that lack of understanding, then they're certainly not held accountable for their sins uh, or the sins of their unbelieving parents, right? Now, you might think of a passage that says God will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon their children to the third and fourth generations, I don't think that has to do with holding them accountable for their father's sins. I think that means, yeah, their father's sins, they affect them, right? When you sin against people, it affects them. It has consequences, and those consequences might reach down from generation to generation. But again, I don't think this has to do with children and infants being held accountable for their father's sins. Again, right? The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the Father, nor the Father suffer for the iniquity of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. If an infant of an unbeliever dies, I don't think God treats that differently than an infant of a believer. So, now that we've gone through all that, we get to David. David, who who pleaded with the Lord for his son to live, and who ate nothing that whole time, he fasted. All of a sudden, when his baby dies, he's ready to eat again. He goes and worships the Lord, and his servants are very confused by this. Then his servants said to him, What is this thing you have done? You have fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Those words, I shall go to him, are where we should focus. David says about his baby son who passed away, I shall go to him. Now, does this mean he's just going to go to him when he dies, right? Uh, That he's just going to be buried in the dirt, maybe in the same place, or maybe in a tomb, the same tomb? If you just read this, that may be a good conclusion. But we know that David did believe in a resurrection. He believed in an afterlife. At the end of Psalm 23, he says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yeah, forever, right? He believes he will live forever in the presence of the Lord. Now, another thing that we see with David is that when his other son, a very, very evil son uh, who has grown up, when that son dies, his reaction is very, very different. And, you know, we'll get to that story soon because it comes up in a few weeks. But for now, I'll just show you this in that chapter. Chapter 18, verse 33. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son, Absalom. My son, my son, Absalom. Would I had died instead of you, O Absalom, my son, my son. Look at all that repetition. It's weighing on him heavily. It hurts so bad. His response is so different than his response toward his little son who died a baby. Absalom was all grown up, and yeah, again, he was very, very evil. And so David did not have that same hope for him like he had for his baby son. The last person that I want to look at today is Job. There's something very interesting that Job says that lends itself to this topic. 
First, I want to point out that, that like David, Job also believes in the afterlife, in the <coughs> resurrection. And so in Job 19, he says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I, will sh who I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. Job believes in a resurrection, in an afterlife. So when we look at what he says earlier, we think, okay, so he likely believes that those who pass away as infants would also be a part of that resurrection. So this is Job 3, 11 and 19. Why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb and expire? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breast that I should nurse? For then... I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not as hidden, or as a hidden stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. Job's gone through, through so much, right? He's lost everything. He's at rock bottom, and he at this moment is wishing that he had died as an infant or had been a stillbirth because he believes then he would be at rest, in a place where kings and counselors are, in a place where there are no troubles from the wicked anymore, where the weary are at rest, where the prisoners are at ease together, where the slave is free from his master. That's where Job believes he would be if he had died as an infant. Now, with Job and David speaking both during a narrative, we know that sometimes they can be wrong, right? The Bible isn't wrong. But sometimes when it shows people talking in a story, those people can be wrong, right? So that's why with David and Job, we don't have that 100% confirmed answer uh, for our um, question today. Um, yeah, because, I mean, I believe that they're telling the truth here. I believe that it's true. But, you know, it doesn't give you that right confirmation if it comes from that speaking from a narrative, right? So, there is that. We don't have the 100% confirmation. But when you take all of these verses and these passages that we've looked at today, and you put them all together, it does create a very, very strong case for the idea that if a baby dies, no matter what the parents' beliefs are, it does go to heaven. And I've been very encouraged at looking at these passages. Right? We've seen what David and Job's thoughts are on the matter. And we've seen how God feels very, very strongly about those who lead children astray, or do them harm, right? He loves, loves, loves those little ones. He loves them. And we've seen how it's understood that they don't really know the difference between good and evil. Their understanding is not on the same level. And so it doesn't seem like they're judged the same way. So I really do believe that babies or young children who don't yet have that understanding of good and evil, or maybe they have a disability that, that stops them from having that kind of understanding, I really believe that they go to heaven if they pass away. And there's strong, strong evidence for that in the word of God, the true word of God. Bow with me in prayer. God, I thank you that you are, that you are so good. Um, and I know this is a, a hard topic to go through, but I still thank you for your goodness, Lord. And uh, yeah, I just pray that you would be with us here, now, but also forevermore and throughout our lives, Lord. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again, Lord, for your love, for us, for the little ones. And I just, uh, yeah, pray that we would go on honoring you in our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.